So the next presentation is by committee. Um, this presentation will be given by Rosalind Liang, David Maranto, Shiki Shu, and Maggie Ko from the University of Toronto Aerospace Team with a talk entitled Finch, a blueprint for accessible and scientifically valuable remote sensing satellite missions. Who wants the clicker? Clicker? Hi everyone, it's been such a fun learning experience learning from all the amazing talks this weekend. Today we are very excited to be presenting our mission, Finch, a blueprint for accessible and scientifically valuable remote sensing. So this is our team, or a tiny fraction of our team who made it to picture day. We're the University of Toronto Aerospace Team Space Systems Division. Basically we're a fully student-funded design team for CubeSats with scientific payloads. We're also a no-access barrier team, meaning we welcome all students across all faculties, regardless of prior experience. So as you can see, we cycle through a new mission once every approximately four years. So before Finch came our last mission, Heron, and after Finch, eventually will come our next mission, probably also named after a bird. So hi, I'm Maggie Ko. I'm the payload systems lead. I'm Rosalind Liang. I am the science co-lead. I'm David Marento. I'm the optical design lead. And I'm Shiki Shu, and I'm a payload alum. So Finch is a 3U CubeSat flying in low Earth orbit imaging in the shortwave infrared range. It stands for the Field Imaging Nanosatellite for Crop Residue Hyperspectral Mapping. So today we'll be talking to you about the development of Finch, including the parallel threads of mission design and payload design and how the two feed back into each other in the uniquely situated undergraduate satellite design team. So we're currently in the tail end of our high level design phase with really good design work taking place across subsystems, but today we'll be focusing on its scientific payload. So with Finch, what we hope to do is to design, verify, and launch the very first GRISM-based hyperspectral camera on board a CubeSat, and not only do so, but open source all of our hyperspectral imagery, as well as our full design documentation to increase accessibility for any other undergraduate and graduate teams hoping to follow in our lead. So I'm going to start by telling you about our process of arriving at our mission objectives. You may think that selecting a science objective is relatively straightforward, like picking a point on a map and navigating yourself towards it. Well, however, take for example how we got to this conference. We had it all planned out. However, we ended up on two separate flights, one of them which got delayed. We got locked out of our housing in the middle of the night and basically ended up hitchhiking to this conference yesterday morning, making it just in time. All this to say, we found that um, to actually arrive at a science objective that is both technically feasible and scientifically interesting for a student team like us requires many iterations of feedback between uh, research and engineering. So here's an example of how we got to where we are. Our first selected mission was actually to monitor atmospheric uh, methane enhancements over Toronto landfills. Sounds fun. So we were going to do this using the atmospheric features found between 1,600 and 1,700 nanometers. Uh, however, after some payload design iteration, we realized that the uh, spectral resolution we're able to achieve is just shy of the less than one nanometer uh, value that's documented in literature for this type of work. So what we really needed to do now was find a way to estimate the error in our data that we could expect from these parameters. So that's exactly what we did. Well, what do you expect a couple of nerds to do when you're told you can't do something? We go and convince ourselves if we can do it. So what we did after an iteration of payload design was we took the parameters, we used the sources of uh, noise and the limitations coming from the payload, and mapped the column methane from state space to estimation space and generated an estimate for the error. And what we discovered, uh, so this is called a linear error analysis. And what we discovered from it was that in order to reach a 25% relative error for the methane enhancements above the greater Toronto area, a signal to noise ratio of 2000 was required whereas the estimate for SNR for our own payload design turned out to be somewhere around 85. Not great. So we figured out, well, methane isn't doable, but with these learnings coming out from the linear analysis, we went ahead and scoped our next mission. 
So we decided to pivot from an atmospheric sensing mission to something a little more down to earth, literally. Um, so what I mean is ground sensing. In particular, we chose crop residue mapping as the best alternative mission. So basically in agriculture, there's a practice called crop residue retention, where by leaving some residual harvest on the soil, you're able to reduce erosion and greenhouse gas emissions. And there's a lot of interest right now in looking into how satellite remote sensing can better monitor and map these uh, policies um, than traditional land-based measurements. In particular, uh, we're taking advantage of this method called spectral mixture analysis, which does not actually require any um, spectral indices, which are, have very high uh, spectral resolution and SNR requirements. Uh, furthermore, a lot of this work so far has been done using multispectral imagery, um, so, such as this uh, example figure taken from a uh, multispectral study. So what we found is that we have a unique opportunity here to do an interesting proof of concept for hyperspectral crop residue mapping using this method uh, in the shortwave infrared range. It will, as a side note, require us to extend our spectral range to 900 to 700 nanometers, which is still well within our sensor range. So we were able to greatly improve our design feasibility knowing we can do this, while knowing that it is still something scientifically valuable. And now we'll dive into the design of the payload itself, the Finchai. So this is it. This is the Finchai. It is a compact um, hyperspectral imaging spectrometer being designed using mostly uh, off-the-shelf parts. Um, uh, oops. Oh, sorry, let's flip back one. Uh, let's take a look at some specs. So I'll clarify now that uh, the specs you see listed here uh, were optimized for a previous design that mapped or that was optimized for the methane uh, imaging mission profile, which Rosie mentioned. Uh, we are currently working towards optimizing the design for the crop residue mapping uh, mission profile. Um, we believe that designing systems based on commercial components is a very good way of gauging the degree to which a technology has permeated the market. And we hope that the Finchai, when it launches, will be a very good snapshot for the commercial miniature hyperspectral imaging, imaging market um, when it launches. So let's take a look at some specs. Uh, we are designing within a volume envelope of about 1.5U, targeting a spectral resolution of 2 nanometers with a spatial resolution of 75 meters and a swath width of about 100K. Okay, so let's break down the design in more detail now. Um, on a high level, at the system level, uh, it is composed of seven individual components. Uh, we make use of achromatic lenses for collimator and focuser lenses uh, to suppress chromatic aberrations as much as possible. Uh, this is, of course, a uh, hyperspectral push broom imager, and so we make use of a rectangular slit there to crop our field of view to a rectangular scan line across the terrain. Um, that light is then propagated into the grid zone. That is where the magic of the diffraction happens, and it's the most exciting component, in my opinion, in this design. That is a volume phase holographic grism, which diffracts the light. Uh, sorry if we could flip back one more. Uh, which diffracts the light and maps the diffracted light onto the sensor with spatial information encoded in the across track direction and spectral information in the along track direction. Uh, the sensor of choice is the Tau SWIR sensor from Teledyne FLIR. That is a 640 by 512 in gas sensor that is sensitive to the 900 to 1700 nanometer range. Now, let's talk a little bit more about why this technology is so ex exciting, the, uh, the VPH grisms. So a grism is effectively a grating that is sandwiched between two prisms. Uh, what's special about a VPH grating, however, is that uh, unlike traditional surface relief gratings that are usually um, have, have uh, uh, etched grooves along uh, the body, that is what enables the diffraction. For a VPH grating, it is actually one um, monolithic, monolithic dichromate gelatin substrate with a um, varying index of diffraction across its length, and that is what enables the diffraction to take place at the surface. Um, and in doing so, we actually are able to achieve very uh, efficient, very uniform um, uh, diffraction efficiencies across a broad bandwidth. Um, well, the, the key appeal, however, of the technology is that uh, the prisms actually enable us to control the center wavelength that passes straight through um, the, the grism. Um, and unlike surface relief gratings, uh, we can compactify our design to be a very simple, compact, inline design, uh, whereas for a surface relief, you, uh, you often need to uh, have, a, have a tilt uh, following the, the diffraction grading to capture the spectrum that you want um, out of the angular distribution of, of diffractive wavelengths from a traditional grading. One of the disadvantages and one of the things that we're exploring uh, uh, currently is their potential susceptibility to changes in refractive index with temperature. So that is ongoing uh, investigations. 
Now, of course, um, we, uh, develop a lot of internal computational tools to help us in the design of the, of our, of our, of our payload. Um, one of them being payload designer. So this is a tool that implements, uh, the very complex equations that model a hyper, hyperspectral imaging payload. Uh, it is a numerical analysis and parametric design tool written in Python. Uh, we primarily use it to convert scientific requirements to technical requirements. We use it to conduct trade-off analyses and convey design limitations to stakeholders. Now, just as importantly, it is also primarily an education tool to, uh, help our members learn how to, uh, or the basics of software architecture and design. So here's the mechanical backbone of the payload. Uh, the main housing for the optics, as you can see, is a two-piece barrel assembly with variable radius for easy assembly and disassembly. It's fastened together with uh, M standard M3 screws, uh, and it's gonna be machined in aluminum 6061 for cost, accessibility, and ease of manufacturing. So you can see there are some holes on the side. That's where we'll be depositing our glue to stake down our grism. Here's a cross-section view of that, so you can see the variable radius makes a toroidal interface with the optical components for high alignment. We'll be preloading that with our retaining rings, which are off the shelf, and we left a space within the GRISM housing for a temperature sensor so we can validate its performance in space. That takes us to some next steps for Finch. Okay, so in terms of the optical design, we are uh, continuing to develop our, our, our prototypes. We are actually expected to build our first uh, benchtop prototype of the optical payload by the end of this month. Uh, we are expanding the spectral range to better satisfy the needs of the updated mission profile. And we are continuing interest discussions with our mechanical team to uh, increase our volume allowance for the four optic to increase our light capturing ability as much as possible. Of course, that results in increased signals to noise. Moving forward, to verify the performance of our payload, we've uh, designed these two acceptance level tests. So the first one will be uh, testing our imaging quality within our TVAC chamber. So there's gonna be three general tests. The first one is for spectral accuracy. The second one is for SNR, which is based on the findings from our linear error analysis. And the final one is for the uniformity of our sensor. Similarly, we'll be having a three-part vibration campaign in order to minimize the risk of damaging our most sensitive and cost prohibitive components, such as the uh, FLIR tau. So moving forward, here's the next steps for the payload. Right now, we're optimizing our design in detailed level well, design uh, following the pivot to crop residue mapping. That'll take us to integration with the rest of the subsystems in fall of next year, uh, with acceptance testing in spring of the year after, leading to a 2025 launch date. When we hope we'll be back again. <laughs> I drew that rocket, by the way. <laughs> so that brings us to a close. Uh, we are incredibly excited to see where the Finch mission will go. Um, we, believe, uh, we hope that our work serves as a blueprint for how other student design teams can push the definition of what's possible for a student team. Should you be interested in reaching out, and please do, we're always uh, looking forward to working with uh, advisors and people in the industry to connect from and learn from. Uh, you can reach us at spaces at utah.ca, and our material is, is listed here at these QR codes. Uh, we'll take any questions you have now. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Coming down the aisle. Dave. Does the uh, payload need to be cooled? And if so, how do you achieve cooling to uh, reduce noise and yeah, I can take that increase question. efficiency? Oh, right, uh, so cooling. Right now, uh, so the sensor that we have has a thermal electric cooler embedded in it. Uh, we need to conduct further thermal analysis to determine that, but as a part of our timeline, as you saw, uh, we're looking to perform stop analysis to validate that uh, GRISM performance. The, what about the collimator? The collimator, interesting question. Now, that wasn't something we were initially concerned about, uh, but I'm sure our analysis will tell us otherwise. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, he took my first question, so here's, here's the second question. You mentioned you were student-led and student-funded. Can you talk about a little bit about that funding model and any uh, advice you might have to other student groups in other universities? Yeah, absolutely. So we're actually quite unique in that we're funded by the entire student body of the Uni University of Toronto via student levy. So it looks something like a dollar per semester per student. 
and we're incredibly fortunate. This is something that we have to review, renew via a referendum every two years, and we don't take it for granted. And it's part of the reason why we open up our team to all students across all faculties, because access accessibility is a really central part of our team values. And then we train the students that come in, and with enthusiasm, we really do believe that anyone can pick up the skills, and we've seen that happen on the team, so. Thank you very much, and the rocket logo is awesome. Thank you.